I mean, this can't go any worse than last time, right? Right? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. It's attempt number two to silver solder the entirety of my Fire 2 boiler project. The previous attempt at this ended on the bandsaw, so let's see how this one goes. Okay, core made, shell made, and now I just gotta mate the two of them together. Quick catch up if you're new to this project. This is a vertical fire tube model steam boiler for powering model engines and other steam related shenanigans. I have a playlist for this entire build, so I do recommend catching up with that. There's a link down below. So the core slides in there, but you really need a little better clearance than this. It's kind of a snug fit. Silver solder needs more of a gap than that. So that's the first job here. I'm gonna start with the drill and a sanding flap drum thing, and I'm just gonna clean up the inside of this. This might be too slow for actually clearancing the copper, but I have to do a cleaning on it anyway for the silver solder, so I'll start with that. And that does fit better, so I continued with that all the way down. I think that's still a little snug though, so let's get out the feeler and see how much more work there is to do. Every test fit requires lining up the stud holes and installing the studs. This stud system does work quite well, although I think next time I might actually just use rivets that are not actually peened over just to hold things in place for soldering and other test setups like this. There are six of these studs, three at each end, and they all line up thanks to the power of the DRO. The holes in the shell were made on the DRO, and then a fixture made on the DRO was used to hold the plates in place for silver soldering. In other words, a digital readout can turn any clown into a half-baked machinist. I'm going for two thousandths of clearance on the joint this time. My previous attempt at this boiler, I went with one and a half, and I think that was a little tight, so I'm going to err on the higher side this time. A little more clearance is, I think, better. Up to six you can get away with with silver solder. There's definitely some tight spots, so I'm going to need to clearance this a bit. And rather than using the sander on the shell, I think it's going to be a lot quicker just to clearance the tube flanges over here on the scotch bright wheel. I only need to take like a couple of thousands off at most, and the scotch bright wheel on copper has no trouble doing that. You have really good control here with this thing. I just marked the tight areas with Sharpie and then did a couple of rounds of hitting those spots on the scotch Bright wheel and then I had a nice tooth out clearance all the way around both flanges. Very nice. Next I prepared my silver solder so I'm making large rings here and I gotta open them up a little bit. I want them to be a little larger than the shell in diameter so that they're kind of held in by spring tension. Now very importantly this is a lower temperature silver solder than what I used on the tubes. That's the whole strategy here so that I can silver solder those without risking damage to those tube joints. Now I'm going to pickle these two components. Ostensibly I don't need to do that because they've both been mechanically thoroughly cleaned but you know for the five minutes it takes to pickle might as well. Now I'm going to flux both sides of both joints and I'm going to get flux in the stud holes there to make sure solder can get through there. Those stud holes will be leaks if solder doesn't get through. I'm also fluxing the other tube joint even though I'm only going to be doing one at a time just to keep things clean there so that when I go to do the second one there's less risk of contaminants being inside that joint. So everything all fluxed up and then I slide the core back in there which goes in very easily because I've got two thou of clearance all the way around that thing now. Now I gotta just center it up on the stud holes once again and then I gotta get the studs in there. Now the studs themselves have also been pickled. Everything's gotta be pickled and fluxed and clean and yada yada yada. So then the studs get dipped in flux and I thread those in. The whole goal here is to hopefully have solder flow all the way out through the studs as well. Then I touched up the flux on those joints again because, you know, it gets pretty messed up sliding the core in there. Just want to make sure that it's all covered. That flux will melt down into the joint as well, so you don't have to worry too much about wiping the flux off the joints as you slide the things together. Then the ring of solder goes on there and we are ready to go. Clean up some of the excess flux there and then over to the hearth. Now this is not a great hearth, but I needed extra clearance because I've got the boiler sitting on a lazy Susan there, primarily because I couldn't afford a hardworking Susan, but I can compensate for the weak hearth by using a big torch, as you can see. So I'm doing a general heating of the entire shell now all the way around, just kind of bringing the whole thing up to close to silver solder temperature, and then I'll start hitting one area at a time and working my way around. 
I'll walk you through these stages of the flux here because it really helps understand the temperature of the joint. The first thing that happens is the water boils off and it turns into a powder kind of stuck to the surface. Regardless of white flux or black flux, they have the same stages. And after that, the powder melts into kind of a foam. I call this the dirty snow phase. Then the foam kind of settles down and turns into a clear liquid. And this is where the magic is about to happen. When that clear liquid appears, the silver solder is just about to melt. And what you're looking for is that silver solder to dramatically flash into liquid. It's very obvious when it happens. Here's an example of that solder flashing moment right there. You see that? How it turns from like wire to liquid mercury kind of instantly. And then once I get an area flashing like that, then I just kind of work my way around the neighboring areas because once you've got that one spot hot enough, you can just carry the heat around as you go. Towards the end, it goes faster as the heat accumulates in the shell. So you'll see the entire back half of it flash all at once there, which is very exciting. And of course, I'm only heating the outside of the shell here. The whole point of silver soldering is that you want the joint or the metal itself to, to melt the solder, not the torch. And then once it's done, I kind of work my way around one more time, just to make sure there's no lingering spots that didn't flow properly. Once the torch is off, another quick inspection all the way around. It's not too late to reflow something right now if it needs it. This is your chance before you cool it down and pickle it, because then it's much harder to get it all hot again. But it looks good, so now I covered it up and I'm going to let it cool as slowly as possible to hopefully not stress any of the joints. Once it's cool to the touch, it goes into the pickle bath again to clean all of that crud off of it. Five minutes in the pickle bath. This is Sparex number two, by the way, this pickling acid. It's really good stuff. It works as fast as a 10% sulfuric solution, but it's a lot safer, I think. The pickling acid does an amazing job of loosening all that crud, so into some clean water and everything just wipes right off. And I use a plastic bristle brush to brush the teeth of the tubes there, get all into all the nooks and crannies. So the joint now looks really, really good. I'm just running a pick over it to see if any of those dark spots are leaks or if they're just crud. And so far it's all just crud, it cleans right off, so that's great. I've got one spot right there that is not crud, so that might be a leak. And the other area I'm a little concerned about are the studs. I didn't get solder through the backs of the studs like I was hoping, but otherwise this joint looks really good. I'm feeling really good about this. Did the exact same prep work for the other side now. Nothing different here. And this seemed to go well as well. After pickling, another inspection, and this joint looks good. I don't see any suspect areas there at all, other than once again, the studs did not get solder through the back of them, so possible leaks there. Now I did get solder through the fronts of most of them, so that's encouraging. Four of the six have rings on the front, two of them do not, so those are possible leaks as well. Next up are the four boiler bushings on the front. So the fit there is a little tight. I went ahead and skimmed a little out of there until those were a nice, fairly loose sliding fit. Again, looking for, you know, a couple thousandths of clearance there. Now you may recall that these have a fixture plate to keep them aligned with each other so that the water gauge will fit after these are silver soldered. So I installed them in the fixture plate and then these get fluxed and then I made solder rings to go around those. These solder rings are a tight fit on the boiler bushings because I want to make sure they stay tight against the bushing and don't slide up onto that steel fixture plate and risk soldering the plate to the bushing. And people have suggested a bunch of stuff for preventing issues like that. For example, whiteout apparently or carbon pencil apparently will keep silver solder from sticking to things. But I didn't have either of those on hand, so I thought I'll just try and make sure I've got clearance here. So using a pick, I pressed the solder up against the shell and I think that's going to work. And I also plugged the topmost tubes there with bolts just to try and heat sink those a little bit. A little extra insurance against damaging those joints. So here's my hearth setup for these bushings. I've got basically just the bushing area exposed and I'm heating the shell near the bushings, not the bushings themselves or that fixture plate. Although you'll see the fixture plate catches a lot of heat, it's glowing red. But I'm intentionally aiming the torch away from the bushings basically, just trying to heat the shell nearby up to silver solder temperature. And this worked quite well, actually. I got the solder to flow there. It's 
it's really important to have gravity working in your favor, so you got to have the joint that you're doing pointed upwards so that the solder will flow down into the joint. And I'm using a stainless steel rod there to kind of poke the solder into position. Sometimes it shifts around a little bit. A stainless steel rod with some flux on it is a trick from Kozo Hiraoka for moving solder around during the heating. Very helpful. It looked like everything flowed really well, so feeling good about that. So I covered it up and let it cool down slowly again. And gravity was in my favor there and no solder got on the fixture plate, so that's good news as well. The bad news is it looks like not all the solder flowed on this bushing here. So let's pickle it and see how it looks. The news here is actually better than I thought. You can see there's good penetration of the solder, it's just that not all of it flowed, which happens to me a lot because I use more solder than is necessary. So even if it doesn't all flow, you still get a good joint. However, I did go ahead and hit it with the torch again while I was doing the other joints and got it to flow. However, you can see now I've got a big blob on one side because that joint was kind of pointed downwards on, on that side, but it's all flowed and we can fix that blob later. Well, girls and boys, this is it. It's pressure test time. Time to put my PSIs where my solder is. Look, I don't know where that metaphor was going. Anyway, on with the Loctite and the blanking plugs. And I plug one of the top two holes. The other one will be used for letting the air out. Loctite 545 is great because it doesn't care if there's water in the joint and it needs no cure time. You can immediately fill the boiler with water and pressure test it after screwing in the fittings. Love this stuff. And then the pump gets attached to the remaining fitting down below there. And here we go, moment of truth. Now, you may recall that the previous attempt at this boiler, the first test was actually not even watertight. So let's see if I improved on that at least. And the answer is yes, I did. So I'm filling the boiler up and not a drop is leaking out so far. So already I'm on a much better footing than I was on the first attempt at this boiler. I go real slow when I'm close to filling up because I don't want to flood water all over the top of the boiler, which you then have to clean up and get perfectly, perfectly dry. You really don't want to drop a water on this thing when you're doing the pressure test. Otherwise, it's hard to see what's a leak and what's just spillover. So the final plug goes in and tighten it up and let's start building some pressure. So I'm pumping it up very slowly here and I'm not seeing any leaks and I kind of don't believe it. So I'm just kind of going real slow because I think there must be something wrong with my pump. Oh, maybe there's some leaks there. No, that's just standing water. Why isn't it leaking? There must be a leak somewhere. There's something wrong with my test here. Well, so I pumped it up 20 PSI at a time, and then I would lock it there and let it sit. You kind of want to go up in stages, let the copper work harden, let the joint settle and so on. You don't want to stress the boiler too much. That's 90 PSI there. And it's just sitting there. Nothing's bleeding down. Now my target is 120 PSI, which is twice working pressure. And well, everything seems okay. So I guess I'll go up again. So going up to my final test pressure now of 120 PSI. I'm still feeling like there must be something wrong here. Like I'm missing something because this test just seems to be working. And here, finally, there's some signs of moisture on one of my boiler bushings, which is almost a relief. It's sort of like, as a software engineer, if your code seems to just work the first time, that's more worrying because it just means that whatever problem is there is just a lot harder to see. But everything is dry elsewhere, except for that one boiler bushing. And it's only very, very slowly building moisture. Like I can't actually tell where it's coming from. After seven or eight minutes, I see a drop here. And it took me quite a while to figure out if there was a leak there or not, or where it was coming from. Putting the joint that's suspect pointing upwards helps a lot, because then the drip will stay wherever it forms. And eventually I did find it. Here it is right here. And you can see that it's actually coming from the plug and not the joint. And well, turns out that plug Actually, it wasn't that tight, so I tightened that up and that went away. So here we are camped out at my test pressure of 120 PSI, and that's 15 minutes. My goal is 20 minutes at test pressure, and I'm still checking. Everything is just completely bone dry. I can't find a leak anywhere, even on that one spot at the top or the studs, all of which I thought might be leaks. And here we are at 19 minutes, coming up on my goal. 
58, 59, 20 minutes. There may have been some rejoicing at this stage. I'm not going to lie. Yay! Standard Imperial Victory Dance. With that, I can release the pressure. I try to do this as slowly as possible so as to, again, not shock the boiler too much. It's hard to do with the little knob that this pump has, but let it down as slow as I can. And now I get to show off my favorite stupid boiler trick. You can remove the hose. That thing is full of water, mind you, right now, and no water comes out because much like putting your thumb over the end of a straw, the air can't get in because it's sealed tight. Once you pull out any other plug, out comes the water. And well, now I can file those studs off. I thought I was going to have to touch them up with solder, but it just turns out I really don't need to, so I'm going to file them off right now. It's tempting to go back and touch up some of those joints where I was suspecting problems, but honestly, because the pressure test passed with flying colors, I'm just going to leave it all well enough alone. So those studs are filed down until I can't feel them anymore. And I also used the Dremel to remove that big blob that I got there from touching up that boiler bushing when it was at a weird angle. While I'm doing this, I can share my theory for why the studs are not leaking despite not having solder all the way through them. By design, the stud holes are very close to the tops of the tube flanges. And my whole thought was silver solder will flow down underneath them and I won't have to worry about them being inside the pressure vessel and being a source of leaks. So it's possible that that actually worked as I'd hoped and maybe that's why they don't leak. But hey, I'm not going to look a gift boiler in the mouth. And just because the internet gets sad if I don't do it, I'm going to polish up the copper a little bit. This is just for your benefit because this is all going to tarnish in a week and it's all going to be covered with lagging and other fittings and things before it's done. You will never see any of this copper once the boiler is finished. But just because I love you, I'm going to do a really half-assed polish on it. It is actually worthwhile to polish the tops of the boiler bushings to make sure that they're going to seal properly. They get pretty gummed up with flux residue and Loctite and other things during the pressure testing and silver soldering process. and You want those all to be clean and nice when the final fittings go on them. There's still lots of fittings to make and the firebox, of course, but the pressure vessel is the hard part. And in that regard, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a good boiler.